Hello, sisters. Welcome to the Sacred Medicine Podcast, weaving powerful, soulful practices into functional medicine. Step into this beautiful space of devotion and explore everything from nurturing foods, rituals, sexuality, and awakening your innate sensuality. It is time to own your radiance. This is the Sacred Medicine Podcast. And we are back for another week of the Sacred Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Margaret Romero, and this week we are talking about a subject that I have not spoken about on this podcast yet, and the subject is all about trauma. I have Rachel Maddox this week. She is a trauma educator and coach. We talk about the definition of trauma, what that is, some of the signs of trauma, We talk about how to get help. We also talk about sex after trauma. So this is a really big subject and pretty profound. Also, we talk about if you were, you know, as a a patient, how to sort of bring this up with a practitioner or with your primary care provider. Um, And, you know, I think a lot of women or men and men also just don't want to talk about trauma, their past trauma, whether it happened in childhood, as an adult, it's really a difficult subject to bring up. So we talk about helping you bring this up with a practitioner, you're a practitioner of choice. And For all of uh, those of you who may be practitioners already, some of the things to ask for, inquire about with your patients. So we also talked about that. And also some trauma-sensitive pleasure practices, which is all really pretty cool. Hope you enjoy this episode. It was information-packed. I really learned so much on many levels here. So here we go. On to the show. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Sacred Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Margaret Romero, and today I have a very special guest, and that is Rachel Maddox. She is a trauma educator and coach. Rachel, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Margaret. So we are talking about a topic that I have not covered on this podcast before, and that is all about trauma. And it's definitely something, to be honest with you, that I don't dive deeply into in my practice. It is a question that I will ask for in during my initial interviews with my patients, but I typically refer them out to therapy if they have experienced trauma or any type of sexual trauma. So I'd love to really dive deep into the subject with you because I would also love to have a lot of my questions answered. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who are listening who um, could really benefit from the information you're going to provide today. Awesome. So, So glad to be here. Thank you. Okay. So why don't we start with what I mean, you're so passionate about this and, you know, I wanted, I would love to just know what made you so passionate about it and did you have a personal experience with trauma as well? Yeah, totally. So, um, yes. And what I'll just say before I even tell any bit of this story is that if you do have a history of trauma and listening to this might be a little intense or triggering at any point you're welcome to pause this interview and come back to it at a later time. Um, Listen to it in a time and place where you feel really safe and grounded. That said, I'm not going to be telling anything graphic about my history. We won't get into any graphic stories that might trigger you, but just talking about this subject can be triggering for a nervous system that has a history of violation. So that said, um, basically, I experienced sexual trauma at a pretty young age, sexual violations, um, ongoing for about eight years from very early, like 12 to 18. Then I got married or I met a man who became my husband. 
And we had a very sexless, safe, platonic, cuddly relationship. It was a life save. It was exactly what I needed. It was a respite from a lot of violation that I had experienced. But eventually my sex started waking up. I had enough time off, enough safety, enough of a breather that I started to really awaken in this new way. And a number of other things were happening in our relationship. And it was clear that our paths were no longer meant to be together. So he and I broke up. I was 25. I was single as an adult for the first time. And I got date raped twice. And at this point, Mm. I was like, oh, my God. I thought that was stuff that could only happen to me when I was a kid. Like, what's wrong with me? I'm an adult. I don't know what the hell to do here. I have no idea how to navigate sex safely. Like, I'm a mess. And I went back and forth between what's called hypersexuality and hyposexuality between having lots of sort of emotionally and physically unsafe sex with people to going on bouts of celibacy. Like I can't have sex. I don't know what I'm doing here. I I have to stop having sex with all people. And eventually a few things ended up happening. Um, I ended up developing what would have been clinically diagnosed as vaginismus, which is pain in your vagina that won't go away, your vulva. I had that. Um, I had horrific, horrific period pain, so much so that I at one point passed something that could have been, could have looked like a miscarriage. It was so big, but it wasn't. I had been celibate at the time. So I was having all kinds of weird physical things happening. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I actually developed vaginal melanoma on my vulva right next to my clitoral hood. I had to have surgery, have that removed. And at that point, after a number of other weird experiences were happening in my mid to late 20s, um, I realized I had a problem, right? And I didn't know what it was, and I didn't want to call it what it was, which was sexual trauma, right? Because I didn't know what sexual trauma was. Nobody talks about it. We, We understand that people experience violence and violations, but we don't really know what trauma is and how it works and how it resolves. And so at this point, though, I was 28. I moved home to my parents' house. I had cancer. I had no money. I was like a mess. And I, you know, by the stroke of God or whatever, was introduced to a woman named Bridget Vixens, who has a trauma resolution training program called Alchemical Alignment, which is rooted in somatic experiencing, which is one of the biggest, most well-known trauma resolution modalities in the world. And I trained with her. I went to her. I had three one-on-one sessions with her, and I could feel like my entire body, my entire physiology, everything about me, my confidence, my sense of safety, my sense of power, my sense of pleasure and aliveness were all different after three sessions. And I was like, holy crap, what is this stuff that we've been doing here? And how can I educate everyone about it? Because no one actually knows how trauma works and how it resolves And we have a lot of people spending a lot of time and money in therapy that's not necessarily effective or trying other things when if they could deal with the trauma in a way that was actually um, correct, so to speak, that was actually effective, they'd be saving a lot of time, money, and, and pain. So it became my devotion and my passion to educate. And I wrote a book. My first book was called Secret Bad Girl, and it's a sexual trauma memoir and resolution guide. Um, And I've been educating ever since. And now I'm working on my second book, which is called Sex After Trauma. Oh, when does that come out? That comes out September 2018. But the Kickstarter is um, live between Thanksgiving and Christmas of 2017. So Mm. Probably while this is airing, the Kickstarter is live, and there's all kinds of ways that you can support that book so that it gets out into the world, because it's definitely a grassroots movement, this thing. Great. Okay, we'll we'll definitely put a link to that um, in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Okay, and then, okay, so your next second book is coming out. Okay, great. Well, I thank you for that. Um, Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your personal story with us. Yeah. Um, okay. So that, so then you became, you, you did the training and you just started working with women and, or like, what were your next steps after that? Yeah. So after that, I mean, it became really clear that there was a really big need that was unmet. 
So there's just so many women who have trauma who don't know that they have trauma. So first step was really becoming an educator in the self-help and personal development industry around what trauma is and how it works and how it resolves. And then, yeah, I have one-on-one clients. I have groups. I do, you know, all kinds of workshops, retreats, that kind of stuff. Oh, great, great, great. Okay, Mm -hmm. so why don't we talk a little bit about um, maybe some of the signs that someone – if someone's unclear if they actually have trauma or um, they're not really sure who to go to or what to do. Uh, But maybe we'll start with some of the signs. Yeah, sure. Um, Well, I'll back up a little bit and just give a little bit of a definition of trauma because then it'll help see the signs. Mm. Yeah, great. So the way that I define interpersonal trauma, so trauma that's happened in a relational space as opposed to like a car accident or something like that, is an emergency, an embodied violation hangover. Excuse me. Embodied violation hangover. So each word's important. The first word, it's embodied. It's something that lives in your nervous system. Violation, meaning that you were either neglected long enough, exploited in a big enough way, shamed or repressed in a way that stuck with you largely enough. Um, There was violence or oppression or manipulation or control done to you or over you. And that violation is stuck in your body even after it's no longer happening. Mm, mm -hmm. So this is what trauma is. It's the hangover of a violation that gets stuck in your body long after the fact. And in your body, it's in your nervous system. And so the way your nervous system works is there is an automatic emergency response. Um, There's a, a thing called a neuroception that perceives a level of threat or violation and automatically decides how to respond to threat. So the, the different levels are like hypersocialization, fight or flight, or freeze. And with hypersocialization, you're really trying to control the environment around you so that other people feel safe. And therefore, if they feel safe, they won't violate you. So it's people pleasing, um, always really trying to accommodate others, putting others' needs before yours. These are all versions of hypersocialization. The next level up that your body might go to if there's a perceived violation is fight or flight. If the hypersocialization won't work, you might try to fight the perceived violation or run from it. And then the last level is if your body senses that won't work, it would automatically go into a freeze or a dissociative state, which would mean sort of like you're present, but you're not really there. You might lose your voice. You might... um, like lose your capacity to really make a clear decision about something. These are all things that happen when you're in a freeze state. Now, these things aren't trauma themselves. They're just your embodied response to danger. Okay. They're great. They're life-saving mechanisms. They're awesome. But trauma is when you get stuck in one of those states because you never got to successfully employ it. So it didn't keep you safe enough. Okay. So what it can look like then is you're walking through the world always hyper-socializing when you're not actually in danger or like kind of getting into dangerous situations and feeling like you have to fight with somebody, but they're not actually trying to violate you Mm. or you're freezing or you're losing your voice in sex or in sensuality with somebody who really cares about you. Why is that? Well, it's because your nervous system is still wired as if the emergency is happening. Mm-hmm. So trauma resolves by completing those incomplete emergency responses. Okay. <laughs> and we can talk about how, how that happens. Um, totally. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's the definition of trauma. Yeah. And so, and so is, what if you have someone that's listening to you right now and they're like, oh my God, I totally am somebody that tries to please everybody that doesn't necessarily mean that you have had a, a, a history of trauma necessarily though, is it? No, but what it might mean is there might be inquiry for you, which is like, is my pleasing an attempt to stay safe? Mm. And when did that begin? So okay. am I people pleasing as a safety mechanism 
And if so, is it so, you know, there's a normal level of that that we all do. But am I kind of chronically doing that because there's a feeling inside of me that I'm unsafe? Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, you know, one of the core needs that we all have as humans is for safe love and intimate belonging, like to know that we're safe as humans on earth is like a core need. So what are the ways that we can start to cultivate more safety in your body, in your psyche, in your field? So you're not always trying to overplease in order to be safe. Mm, okay, got it. Okay, so okay, so you explain the definition, and then and basically that are these some of the signs that you would see? No. Well, no. sort of, right? Because like if you're listening to this and you're hearing me say these words, your body is probably already responding. So if your body is feeling kind of triggered or you're feeling kind of fast in internally, that might be a sign that there's some unresolved stuff in there, which is totally fine. It's totally normal. Like it's not a death sentence. It's, it's okay. Things do change for sure. Um, but some of the ways it might just manifest like in terms of you're walking down the street, um, when it comes to sex, you might, like I expressed, be either hypersexual or hyposexual. So you might have a very strong desire to have sex all the time or in ways that aren't necessarily emotionally safe or a hyposexuality, like zero sex drive, zero interest in sex. That could be a symptom of trauma because it could be like a deep freeze around sex. Mm. Um, another one might be that you're continuously kind of getting into relationships that are unhealthy for you, meaning that they don't leave you feeling more loved, more cared for, more seen and known. And you know in your mind, God, why am I doing this? But you still can't get off the hamster wheel that you've been on. That often is an indicator that there's a deeper physiological pattern that your system is aligned to as opposed to your system being aligned to a physiological embodied pattern of health. Um, Feelings of like low self-esteem or fear around using your voice can also be rooted in trauma. Again, we lose our voice sometimes when we've experienced enough physiological danger. So a fear of being seen or known, if being seen or known ended up meaning that you were violated, it might really start to scare you to show yourself as who you really are. Fear of being in your power. Anything that could have been exploited um, or neglected or shamed or repressed, you might end up fearing in yourself because it's been violated. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the ways that you might be able to think about it. Yeah. And I think that there, I think sex, sexual trauma is something that women, a lot of women tend to suffer in silence and yeah. not really express it and kind of keep it to themselves and not really sure maybe where to turn, what to do, how to handle it. And so I think this is a really great conversation. And so let's say there is a woman listening to this or a man and they are, you know, you're definitely triggering something in them right now and they're feeling like, oh my God, yes, this is totally me. Um, what... What do you advise a woman or man to do in this instance? Uh, like what, how, what can help them sort of um, not, you know, heal this part of themselves? Yeah. Well, I will also say that it's usually really scary. And one of the reasons if we go back to my story of like, I really avoided dealing with this. I mean, mm -hmm. I had had sexual violation for a long time, but never even wanted to look at it or call it that. And the reason is because your body gets like totally scared in this space because your body's been violated in this space. So when you're realizing, oh my God, I have sexual trauma and like maybe I should do something about that <laughs> or whatever is going through your head, mm -hmm. um, the trauma informed guidance that I would love to give is to just check in with your body. If your body could guide you about the next best step, what would your body tell you to do? One of the big things around, one of the big reasons why we feel the experience of violation is because we've been forced to do something without our consent. 
And so healing our trauma, we don't want to approach it with that same kind of force. We want to approach it with choice and with body sovereignty. So, you know, a lot of people will ask you like, well, where do you feel this or that in your body? That's not the question. The question is, what's your body's instinct? Mm. And your body's instinct might be to turn off the freaking podcast and not come back to this topic for a year. Right. Great. No problem. Your body actually knows what it's capable of right. healing and not healing in any given time. So asking what your body's instinct is, it might be, I really want to go to yoga just once a week and just be with my, start to be with my body again, start to develop a relationship again. Or it might be like, I think I'd like to work with a trauma specialist and like, or it might be, I'd like to go to acupuncture and just move my energy or work with an energy healer or do art therapy or write all the poems. So feeling into your in, own intuitive guidance around the next best step for yourself is super important. And it's the number one way you can honor yourself in your healing process. Mm. Great. And then let's say they feel they're feeling a certain way and they're like, all right, either turn off the podcast or um, mm -hmm. whatever it is, maybe calling up a friend or going for um, a walk by themselves or something like that. What is it, is therapy, um, a necessary next step, would you say? I think what I would say is that there is no necessary next step, that the necessary next step is for you to honor yourself. So mm -hmm. really being in charge of this process for yourself and one thing you might want to do is research what are all of the ways that people go about healing their trauma. And like I've listed a few of them. Therapy can be great if you really need a safe, consistent relationship with someone. So if your trauma happened like with a parent, for example, therapy can be really great because it's sort of like a reparenting process where you get to have a safe relationship with another human in an ongoing setting. But if you had like a one-time experience or a two-time experience, working with a trauma specialist might be more effective because they're trained at helping you actually release and complete an emergency response, which isn't something a therapist is trained in. Therapists are dealing with emotions and ideas, not necessarily the body. Mm, okay. Yeah. But number one is what's your instinct about what you need? Because it's reclaiming our instincts that is core to trauma resolution. Mm, okay. Okay, great. Um, okay, so let's see here. So now, so let's say sex after trauma. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that. Um, if a woman's been sexually violated once or multiple times and they want their, maybe they've um, started dating Again, what is a good way? Because I'm sure there's going to be lots of um, fear around having sex again. Let's talk about that. Yeah, totally. Um, that's so normal. It's so normal to have fear around, around re-entering the world of sex. Because the world of sex is so much more than genitals, touching genitals, right? It's about trust. It's about emotional safety. It's about feeling seen and known. It's about pleasure. Um, it's about a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. It's about power, power dynamics. So I think, you know, the first, there's so many entry points here, but one, one point of entry might be if you're, if you're re-entering the world of sex, um, you might want to ask yourself, what do I need in order to feel physically and emotionally safe before, during, and after sex? Okay. Which can be a really hard question for people because most people who've experienced trauma, one of the things is like, your needs don't matter. You don't even have needs. What does it mean? I have needs? What? Right. Um, so what would you need to feel emotionally and physically safe before, during, and after sex? And I'll just give some ideas. Like you might feel emotionally and physically safe before sex knowing somebody's STD history, knowing what kind of um, 
relationship dynamic this is. Is this a one night stand? Is this, are we dating? Like under adding clarity around the relationship might make you feel emotionally sex, uh, safe talking about trauma and safe words, like knowing that you can tell someone to stop and they'll stop might make you feel safe. Um, really feeling their interest and their, you know, enjoyment of who you are as a person might make you feel emotionally safe, like knowing that they like you or that they're into you. So these are all valid things. Like you can reclaim neediness. It's not a bad thing. And then during sex, you might need or like um, somebody to praise your body the whole time. You might like someone to check in with you and pause and see how you're doing. That might be something that makes you feel both physically and emotionally safe. After sex, you might feel physically and emotionally safe if they um, bring you a glass of water, if they sleep over or don't sleep over, if they call you the next day, if they stay consistently engaged with you as a person. So when we're used to not having our needs matter, these things can feel so vulnerable to even consider. But I really want to urge you to, one, make your lists of what would make you feel emotionally and physically safe before, during, and after sex. And two, practice having that conversation with a girlfriend or a, a boyfriend, somebody who you're not having sex with. Um, start having that conversation in a casual setting so that you can become more versed in it when it comes time to do it with somebody who's a little bit more vulnerable to do it with. And so... When does this conversation come up? And, and ca- you know, if a woman is just starting to, just in the beginning of like dating somebody, is she talking about her whole? Is she is she discussing her journey with this person and telling them, you know, from the beginning, oh, look, this is some of the things that I need. Um, like, how is she approaching it if she's newly dating somebody? I think that's such a good question, right? Everybody wants to know, like, when do I, when, like, when's too soon to get serious kind of stuff? Here's my opinion. My opinion is um, you are totally worth dating someone who can have this conversation. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's sort of giving the keys to your temple away. If you think, like, well... They might not like me if we start talking about this stuff. Like that doesn't like you don't need them to like you. You need to be safe. Right. And your safety, your emotional and physical safety should be more important than if they like you or not. And which is a really hard thing to understand again when we're used to being maybe neglected or exploited or whatever. But so what I will say is that you can trust yourself to know when, when is too soon or when isn't too soon. But you, I would say definitely before you have sex with someone, you want to have this conversation with them. So it might not be something that on the first date you bring up or on the second date you bring up or even on the third date. But Or if you're going to have sex with someone right away, this is a really great test to decide if they're a good, a good person to have sex with. And it can be the first day that you meet. Like, hey, cool. I'm down. I feel the chemistry between us. This is awesome. This is my protocol for before I have sex with someone. I like to have this conversation about what makes us both feel emotionally and physically safe before, during, and after sex. That way, we all walk away feeling like we left each other in better condition than we found each other in. That is the miracle. And that is the call of our time, right? To leave each other in better condition. So... I yes. Think whenever, but before you have sex, have this conversation. I yes, and I I absolutely agree. Though I think that it's hard for people to even say those words that you just said. Yeah. To have with another person because one, they have a hard time maybe even accepting the fact that they, it's something that they don't even talk about or it's something that they're ashamed of or it's something that they are just coming to grips with themselves and then to have to bring it up to someone that's somewhat of a stranger to kind of divulge certain things or say exactly what you said, which I think is totally appropriate and a great conversation piece. But I also feel that what about the women that have a hard time really expressing that? I'm so glad you went back to that because I kind of missed that piece in your question. 
Um, so you do not have to tell someone your whole trauma history when you're having this conversation. Um, and, and I will say again, part of the reason why it's super important to practice with somebody who feels safe Mm -hmm. first, like you could practice this with a therapist, you could practice this with a sex coach, you could practice this with your, your best friend. And you don't even have to tell them about your history. You can just say, I want to start cultivating a really healthy sex life. And this is a prompt I got (laughs) around emotionally safe sex. Three questions. Can we explore these together? Can we brainstorm? What makes you feel emotionally safe and physically safe? Oh, cool. And we just start start getting used to talking about what makes sex emotionally and physically safe. Because safety, by the way, a feeling of safety is translates to orgasm. So just in terms of your listeners and your audience and you know what a lot of people are coming to you for, if we don't have emotional or physical safety, our capacity to orgasm dwindles drastically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if it's a hard conversation for you, this is a really good place to start. This is a really important thing to be working on that if this is a hard thing for you. Um, and working on it in a safe space that's not someone you're having sex with to begin with, I would, I would say, will make you feel more empowered and able when, when it comes time to have this conversation with mm. a lover. Okay, great. I love, okay, that's great. Um, let's see here. And so if someone's coming in to... You know, if they're hearing this podcast and they're thinking, oh, my God, I think, you know, it's triggering something for them and they are, they want to bring up the subject with, with someone, who would you recommend that to be? Um, Who should they be reaching out to that's trained in this? I mean, as a medical professional, I... I have not been taught on how to deal with um, a woman that has gone through sexual trauma in terms of the counseling around it. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I think that I would end up, you know, referring my patients out to, for therapy or I'm not even sure all the different resources that I yeah. have that, would the where I can sort of lead them so can you can we talk about um you know, let's let's go both ways let's talk about what a woman would say to her or man would say to how they could bring this up with someone in order if they're reaching out for help mm-hmm. and you're talking about if they're reaching out to a professional or yes yeah. Um, well, I think, I think what I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question backwards, which is just who do they reach out to? Um, somatic experiencing is a really great database. They've got practitioners all over the world and you can go to their website and you can find somebody who's local to you. And that is a very trauma. It's a, com- it's a completely trauma informed modality that's rooted in consent, that's rooted in emotional and physical safety, that knows how to work with the nervous system as opposed to overriding the nervous system. So I, I, that's the best database that I know of. There's another um, thing called tr- TRE, Trauma Releasing Exercises. You can find Google, you can look on YouTube and find videos of that, or you can go to workshops for TRE. That's another pretty popular thing. Another popular thing is EMDR, Mm -hmm. EMDR, and I actually forget what it stands for, but it's like a rapid eye movement thing, Mm -hmm. and that rewires your nervous system, Um, so you can go to EMDR. These are all trauma-informed modalities, and then there's also trauma-informed yoga, so you can Google and see if there's a trauma-informed yoga near you, so I would say, you know, if you know you have trauma, looking for a trauma-informed healing modality will make it easier for approaching the conversation with whomever the practitioner or healer or you know professional is. And then in terms of what you say, you can 
you know, you know that you're working with someone who's trauma informed when they don't ask you to tell you tell you their whole story or tell them your whole story. Um, because sometimes telling the story is just more tr- triggering and traumatizing than just having the experience shift in your body. Mm-hmm. So if you're reaching out, I want you to know you don't have to tell someone your whole story. You can just be brief. You can be like, I'm dealing with some sexual trauma. I really want a safe um, practitioner. Are you available? And they'll usually have a very safe process that you can go through where you don't have to like reveal all the details of the worst things that ever happened to you. Okay. What was the first one you said somatica experiencing? Is that how you say it? Somatic experiencing. Oh, somatic. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure their website is traumahealing.org. Okay. Everything will be in the show notes. Okay, cool. Okay. Now as a practitioner, if there are any practitioners that are listening who also really weren't well versed in this field, um, and because You know, I actually deal with a lot of women who have sexual issues, um, low libido specifically, and going from, you know, perimenopause into menopause Mm -hmm. and um, issues with orgasm. And obviously, this could definitely, having sexual trauma can affect all of these things. So what are good and appropriate things that I should be asking as well as um i don't know if the word is advising but Mm -hmm. um what are some of the things that i should be looking out for or and or asking during a consultation Mm -hmm. well i think when it comes time and you ask that question about like do you have any history of sexual violence or trauma or whatever Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really nice if you set that up for them by saying like, I just want you to know, I'm about to ask a question that's kind of tender. Um, you can answer it with as much or as little detail as you'd like. Right. So a big piece of trauma is putting the ball back in the court of whoever has experienced the violation and letting them feel power. So giving them choice. So you don't even. So saying like, you don't have to answer the question, you can skip it, or you can tell me as much or as little as you'd like. Then the next piece is when they answer, if they say like, yes, and this happened or whatever, um, telling them that you're so sorry that it happened is appropriate. Like that. And also saying that should have never happened to you. Like Mm. sometimes people have these experiences and they tell people and no one ever says that was fucked up. And it's fucked up, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So being on their team, being on their side, which isn't necessarily, you know, creating a villain out of whomever did whatever, but just really showing compassion. Like, damn, I'm so sorry that happened. And then being slow here. I, I think it's less important that you counsel them and more important that you be with them. Mm, Okay. So in this moment, then just giving it a little time and space and saying, I, I just want to pause here for a moment and let you know that like, if you have any feelings or anything's happening in your body that you notice, just taking a moment for us to just be here and notice how you're feeling right now. Okay. And for you as a practitioner to know that you don't have to fix them, that just letting them feel their feelings around this could be really transformative for them if they've been bottling it up and never told anyone, which is the case for a lot of people. Yeah. And then you can say, I just want you to know, or you could even say this before um, you say the question or whatever, like I'm not trained in trauma resolution, but I do want you to know that there are so many resources available to you. And as a practitioner, what I would do is I would have a little resource sheet that has some of the things I listed for you. Okay. You can, you can also include my website if you want. I work with people. I have groups and coaching and all that jazz books. Um, but, you know, have that resource list that you can give to them and just say, like, you deserve this kind of support as well. I just want you to know it's available to you. And, like, thank you so much for sharing. Mm. Okay. I like that. Making that whole experience gentle and <clears throat> slow. 
Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And invitational as opposed to required. It's also something that I am very conscious of when I am doing any sort of pelvic exams Mm -hmm. um, to really be very mindful and speaking through everything that I'm doing and um, moving at a very, very slow and gentle pace. That's, that's always been my MO and for so many different reasons, not just um, because a woman may or may not have experienced sexual trauma, but just because nobody really likes to get paps and <laughs> nobody mm-hmm. really likes to have to, um, deal with any sort of exam in that way. So I just wanted to kind of put it out there that um, for any practitioner that's listening, that, you know, going very, um, being really diligent about being very slow and very um, explaining everything. Because I've actually, I've had PAPS in the past where things are happening and no one's saying anything, Mm -hmm. no discussion is happening. And then I, you know, then it could be like painful or I'm feeling a cramp and um, like, okay, how long is this going to be going on for? Do you know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And then I would also just add, and you might already do this, but especially if in that intake you've heard that they have sexual trauma, just saying like, I want you to know that at any moment you can tell me to pause or to stop and I will. Mm -hmm. And we could even practice that, which like that would be so radical if you just say, okay, I'm going to put my hand on your knee and you're going to tell me to stop and I'm going to remove my hand. That's something that you could do that could literally change someone's entire life in like a a one minute practice. Because so many women never have the practice of telling someone to stop or pause and for that to be respected. I know. I know. So true. Yes. And so I'm, um, I do, I think that women are it's especially if they have a history of trauma, it's, it's really hard to find their voice sometimes and to yeah. really, because they think, well, I'm in a doctor's office, and so, I, you know, I'll just let them do whatever, and it's fine. I, I have to get this pap done, or I need this exam done, and um, but to know that it's okay, and if your practitioner doesn't listen to you, it's time to get a new one. Definitely, yes, yes. Um, all right, that was great. So any last things that you wanted to add to this conversation Um, that we maybe missed? I think I would just end by saying like, whether you've experienced it or not, you are really worth love and sex going together and safety and sex being an experience that you have together. A lot of people think they can't have these things together or, you know, they have to do some wild trade-off. They have to contort who they are to be the right thing for someone else. And like, you're worth safe love, intimate belonging, ecstatic sex. Like, you're worth all of it. Mm-hmm. And I just want to plant that seed of desire inside of your heart and your soul and your body. Like, that you're worth it and that you can have it. And let that seed take you wherever it needs to take you so that you can have all of yourself back. Mm. Oh, there was actually one more thing that if we can quickly, sure. um, yeah. yes. So one thing I, at one point I really wanted to ask, so you do talk about safe and doable, um, pleasurable practices. Um, mm-hmm. when would this be done? If someone is, I mean, obviously if they're single or, single or partnered, but is this after, um, sex after trauma, you mean just sort of self-pleasuring type of thing? Is that what you mean? Yeah. So, um, I'm really a big proponent of trauma-sensitive pleasure practices. So what are all the ways that you can start cultivating a healthy relationship to pleasure if pleasure has been scary for you? So sometimes when, you know, trauma, we have a history of trauma, we can be really shut down around pleasure because it's actually been unsafe for us. So it's this reclamation process. And you can do that at any point in time, single, coupled, dealing with, you know, your 
healing, not dealing with your healing, doesn't matter. This is like something you can, it's like taking your vitamins. And the way you can think of it is um, like by looking at the senses, we've got touch, we've got sight, smell, taste, and sound. Which of these things is easiest for me to access pleasure through? Do I love music? Do I love the feeling of lotion on my body? Do I love when something is visually, aesthetically gorgeous? Do I love tasting like a raspberry explode between my teeth? Do I love smelling incense? What's the easiest and least triggering or most safe entryway into pleasure for you? And like put them in an order. What feels easiest for you? And start with the the easiest things and ask yourself, cool, okay, if it's taste and sound, can I take one song a day to slowly eat blueberries Mm -hmm. and just revel in how good it feels? If I also really like, you know, if it's, if it's vision, if it's sight and touch, can I let myself um, go into nature and bring lotion and just give myself like a hand massage someplace beautiful? Like what can I do to start infusing my life with pleasure in a way that's totally safe and that doesn't have to do with anyone else? How can I start aligning to that frequency And, you know, ordering the senses and doing what's doable first is where I would recommend starting. Mm, Okay, great. Thanks for, thanks for that. I really needed to, um, I really wanted to ask that question. So thank you. Okay, so how can the listeners, um, how can they reach you? How can they find you? You can find me at rachelmaddox.com. Um, I do have the Kickstarter going for the Sex After Trauma book, which is bit.ly slash sex after trauma. Um, my first book, Secret Bad Girl, you can get on Amazon. And I love hanging out on Instagram, and I'm at Rachel Maddox over there. So that's my, my favorite social media place. Instagram. Yeah, I love it too. I got to find you on there. Yeah, totally. <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay, and the Kickstarter starts when? Thanksgiving or the day after Black Friday to the day before Christmas Eve. Okay. Let me write that down. All right. Great. Okay. So three really quick questions that I end all of my podcast interviews with. Mm -hmm. Okay. First one is, um, let's see for you. Uh, What is one, a book that you're reading right now that you're absolutely loving well, I'm reading lots of books at all times. <laughs> so that's a great question for me because I've been thinking about this book. Um, have you heard of the book or read the book Vagina by Naomi Wolf? Not yet, but I definitely heard of it. Yeah. It's an awesome book. I know there's so much medical information in it. So that might be one that you oh, and your okay. listeners just love and devour. Vagina by Naomi Wolf. It's just like there is a section on the traumatized vagina, which is definitely intense to read. If you have sexual trauma, I would just skip that section because it's just, it's too much. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, but the rest of the book is just packed with awesome information about the history of vaginas, about the connection between the vagina and the brain, um, pleasure and creativity, all kinds of awesome stuff. And Naomi Wolf's like a scholar researcher. So she went around and talked to some of the leading medical practitioners and tantric practitioners all over the world. And it's just awesome. I've been meaning, actually, um, thank you for reminding me, because as always, there's always an ongoing list of books that I have on my list, but that one that isn't on my list just yet for some reason. So thank you, because I'm going to mm-hmm. take a look at that. Um, let's see. What is one of your favorite podcasts right now? Anything that you're like your go-to that you listen to pretty often? Um, I guess this would relate to book recommendations, but Esther Perel, who just wrote the book, The State of, Affair, State of Affairs, and also wrote Mating in Captivity, mm-hmm. she has this series on, um, what's the word, Audible, called Where Should We Begin? And she's, she's a, a fantastic, brilliant, genius couples counselor. Mm-hmm. And there are these live sessions of her counseling people um, 
and she's just a genius. So it's like amazing. You get to witness like a brilliant couples counseling session and it's called Where Should We Begin? And you have to do it through Audible. Okay. Oh, cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And what is currently at your bedside right now? In what way? <laughs> on your on your bedside, whatever is on there, books or um, I don't know. Um, definitely books and journals and um, some jewelry that I took off from the night before. A little bowl of coconut oil is with me at all times, practically. Um, and a lamp, a stained glass lamp that my grandmother made. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, this was really, very, really eye opening for me. And um, I'm really happy that we connected because I learned so much today. And mm -hmm. I, I know that my listeners as well, if they are now I know where to send my patients, but also the listeners know where to go if they feel like they need um, some resources. So all of that will be listed in the show notes as well. And um, yeah, so thank you so much. And good luck on the Kickstarter. I'm going to check that out as well. Good luck with getting your second book out. It sounds, I love the title. Thanks. I think it's definitely, well, it's, it's needed for sure. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved having this conversation with you. And I'm just super excited about everything that you're doing. So needed in the world as well. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I really hope that you got so much really good information during this episode with Rachel. To learn more about her and for all the show notes, for all the links on where to get help, head on over to margaretromero.com forward slash episode 57. Have the most beautiful week. Thank you so much for listening and to being a devoted listener to this podcast. I so, so appreciate it. If you have been loving these episodes, head on over to iTunes, leave me a five star review and I will see you all next week. Much love, big hugs. Take care now. <laughs>